Okay, I think we can get started here. So uh, this week we're gonna be looking at BlenderBot 2.0. Um, I think, but before we get into that, I found it kind of helpful um, to better define some of the some of the unique terms that um, we're seeing come up around chatbots. Um, so in this first section here, engaging this. So in one of the papers, um, they define this as basically who would you prefer to talk to for a long conversation. So I, I think that's uh, that is pretty valuable because it, it's really easy for the chatbot to like give valid answers but really boring ones. Um, spicy is a word that I, I think we're still having some trouble defining. Uh, it's like we we know what it means technically. Is that right, Nick? Like we we know yeah. it's like yeah. a it's something that you control about the output distribution of the the words. Yeah, it's sort of a, a cute term for um, one of the decoder settings, which is temperature. And temperature is, we had sort of, uh, I had sort of messed up the definition last time, so I'd put in some info that I didn't quite understand. Temperature is basically a decoder setting. And in um, when decoding from a language model, uh, you'll often do something called sampling, which is instead of just picking, and this is, you know, in addition to different beam search techniques, you might do something that instead of just picking the most probable word, um, will actually sample from some set of the most probable words. And this kind of prevents um, a very boring conversation from happening. Um, so, you know, in a, last week, there was some kind of um, chart showing the, uh, like distribution of words that are used in human speech and then through beam search. And beam search always picks kind of, what it was comparing is a beam search that picks the most probable words. And that isn't really a good um, approximation of how humans use language. We say surprising things. So the temperature is a setting um, that sort of adjusts the parameters in um, our sampling such that it will, um, if the temperature is very low, it will just make the parameters um, that you're trying, it'll just make the uh, words that you're sampling from a very skewed distribution where the highest probability words um, get an even higher probability through a softmax. So this is just adjusting the softmax. If the temperature is set to one, the softmax functions as it normally does. Um, and what we missed last week is that um, to get spiciness, to get, um, to get the decoder to sample from less likely words at a greater rate, you increase the temperature above one. So you can decrease, increase it to two or to you know, 100 or 1,000. And this will um, sort of squish the probability distribution after the softmax. So that's you know, unlikely words get a much higher probability. And that way, you're kind of more likely to sample an interesting different word that's not the most obvious choice. Gotcha. Yeah. So last week we were we got kind of confused because we were looking at temperature between zero and one. Yeah, uh, and it can go over yeah. one, which is how you get it to be spicy. Cool. Yeah. And then I was thinking you would. Uh, we don't have it today, but it would be. Uh, it'd be cool to to try. Uh, yeah, interacting with the bot and changing this parameter and uh, yeah, see if we can tell the difference. We gather some examples. Yeah, I was going to maybe look at the, um, Facebook has a live um, chatbot example, but um, it doesn't seem to be working anymore. But when it was, there's um, decoder settings where you could change the um, sort of the way it samples and you can change the temperature. Um, so that would have been a good kind of way for us to look at this, but uh, maybe the API request isn't going through anymore. With the, uh, with, do, you, do you think it might be um, configurable from the command line that we've been running to, um, to play with BlenderBot 2.0? I don't know, but it seems, like, um, it seems like the setting must be in there. I haven't looked for it, uh, and I haven't just kind of seen it while I was loading the model, but 
Um, it seems likely that it's in there somewhere, so we can probably, maybe even after this, just look at the, um, see if we can change the decoder parameters without having to reload the entire thing and wait 25 minutes. <laughs> right. Yeah, so right now I've, I've got a, uh, a notebook open where I've, uh, I'm setting up BlenderBot 2.0 so that we can we can play with it live. And it takes about 25 minutes to like download all the model parts and uh, I don't know what, what it's doing. It must download them and unpack them or something. Uh, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's just so many yeah. components that it yeah takes a while. Yeah. All right, so a couple more key terms. Um, yeah, empathy, empathy and personality. I, I found it kind of helpful to like have a, a clear understanding of what these mean. So uh, they've got a paper on it, adding empathy. And an example they give is, uh, I finally got promoted. And then the bot responds appropriately. It picks up on the person's emotion that this is a, a happy thing, a positive thing. and says, congrats, that's great. Uh, and then personality is kind of like having a persona or identity. They've got another paper on uh, adding that quality to a chatbot. Um, and they kind of defined it as like whether you can ask it about uh, personal topics and, and have it give a reasonable, reasonable answer. Like you can ask it, uh, you know, where, where do your parents live or do you have any pets? Things like that. Uh, cool. Um, any other key terms that anyone's noticed that like they're curious about? Throw them in the chat if you think of one, and we'll uh, we'll see if we know the answer. We can look it up. <laughs> um, yeah, and then the other thing, like, so if I, I told a friend that we were working on chatbots, and he's like, "Those are like passing the Turing test regularly now." Yeah. Um, so I think when you play with Blenderbot, you can see it's like mm, not quite. Um, Nick, I, I thought this was interesting that like someone someone announced having passed it a while back, um, but yeah, it kind of comes down to who's judging. So if you're uh, <laughs> if you're if you're working on NLP, then you probably know better how to trick it, how to how to make it screw up. Um, yeah. Ask it, what weighs more, a mattress or a moth? <laughs> yeah, it's a good, it's a good qualitative benchmark, but it does come down a lot to the who's judging. And I think this, um, you know, this was people chatting with a chatbot with a personality of Ukrainian teenager, mm -hmm. um, and so by that token, there's some, uh, you know, ungrammatical things to be expected that would come out oh, of okay. speaks English as a second language. Uh -huh. um, you know, some there are kind of uh, to an untrained judge, you can uh, intentionally insert misspellings. Um, you like put a lag time between when you receive a message and when you output the message. So there are these kind of clever qualitative things that make it look more human. Um, and yeah, some of these things revolved around the personality that was chosen. Um, you know, so by virtue of being a um, teenager who speaks English as a second language, if you really try to drill into some kind of very specific knowledge domain, um, it wouldn't be surprising if a, you know, a teenager who speaks English as a second language can't really give you a, a great coherent response um, that you, one would think an AI does. Um, yeah. yeah, it comes down to the judge. It's sort of a, sort of a tricky metric. Yeah, cool. Yeah, bot is really impressive, though. I think the the example dialogue is is pretty cool. Yeah, even if it is cherry picked, some of the Blunderbot stuff is uh, really impressive, just alone by virtue of what was only happening five years ago. Um, yeah. Cool. All right, I think that's everything I wanted to share. You want to take it from there? Yeah, sure. Um, OK, so uh, we're really just picking off, picking up um, off from last week, where 
the idea was to go through Blunderbot 1, because that's the basis for most of Blunderbot 2, and then talk about Blunderbot 2, but we just sort of ran out of time. Um, so I'm going to give a little more in depth about Blunderbot 2, but this will probably be um, you know, like a shorter session today, although we might just play with the demo for the last kind of uh, the last kind of part of the hour. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, so uh, Blunderbot 2 is basically the same as Blunderbot 1. It has the same kind of um, architectural ideas. And if you remember in Blunderbot 1, it's more like a system of recipes for creating a good chatbot. And so they're really building, um, they're just kind of adding components and modules that will make this even better. Um, so the two main changes are internet search augmentation and memory augmentation over dialogue history. Um, so we find that our system outperforms Blunderbot when it comes to picking up where previous conversations sessions left off with a 70% improvement in engaging the score. 55% improvement in use of previous conversation sessions, according to evaluators. Um, so this metric, uh, to my ears, doesn't really make sense because in Blunderbot 1, there was no multi-session um, ability. Uh, Blunderbot 2, the innovation is that you can incorporate previous dialogue history into new dialogue, even on a new session. And so if you're picking up six hours later with a chatbot, it can remember oh, this is user one, two, three, um, you know, he lives in California, he works on blah, blah, blah. Um, so this kind of uh, thing doesn't exist in one. So of course there's an improvement too. Yeah, so the fact that they like quantify it, 55% <laughs> improvement. Yeah. improvement, right? It's like, it didn't exist before. Yeah, I mean, maybe this was just people qualitatively um, judging the engagingness um, which is a good metric to go by, but uh, the improvement in use of previous conversation sessions is very, very strange. Um, uh, a little more importantly, when testing for ability to use knowledge, uh, Blunderbot done, uh, two reduces hallucinations from nine to three percent, um, and is factually consistent in, uh, across uh, conversation twelve percent more often. So these are kind of more. Um, more interesting improvements, whereby we reduce some of the hallucinations where you might be talking to one of these and ask it about um, you could ask it about a given topic, and it will confidently kind of hallucinate knowledge that it's cobbling together from different sources, um, and that's sort of a, a known problem. And a reduction uh, for nine to three percent is pretty good. Um, and consistency, and this kind of includes the consistency across the conversation twelve percent more often. So, you know, in one turn of the dialogue, it will say, I love basketball. And then, you know, a minute later, it will say, I can't stand basketball. Um, so reducing that kind of cons uh, inconsistencies in your conversation is another good metric that they're going with. Yeah, I ran into that a lot playing with it. Like a lot of the questions I asked, it would like in within the response, you know, I'd ask like, uh, Something, yeah, like the example I had was like, I asked it, you know, is, is your is your dad still alive? And within the same sentence, it said like, no, he's not. And yeah, he's doing pretty good. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, maybe, maybe in the afterlife, I don't know. <laughs> right, that's you true. Specify. Yeah. Um, what yeah, I saw, I saw an interesting example in a paper um, and it makes it, it makes sense. Um, very much why this would happen, but you feed as a prompt to your language model and just ask it for the next word. You feed in a prompt like, um, I love basketball. I play it all the time. Uh, I really dislike blank. Um, and in many kind of language models, if you have a very kind of naive decoder strategy, um, it will probably generate basketball as the next word. So I, I really love basketball. I really dislike blank. Um, it's just primed to look at basketball. Um, that word has been primed in the previous dialogue history in the prompt. Um, and so you kind of understand why these inconsistencies happen if you suddenly negate um, somewhere into the flow of conversation what you're talking about. Interesting. Um, yeah. Uh, I thought that was a good example. Yeah. I was curious too about the, the term hallucination. Uh, mm. 
I'm going to add that to the key terms table up there. Uh, why do you think they use that term? I mean, it seems like what it is is just like factual inaccuracy. Um, do you think they call it, maybe they call it hallucination because it's like, it, it gives the response confidently uh, instead of like, I'm not sure, is it California? <laughs> yeah, I think it's just because it's, I, I'm, I don't know why the terminology was chosen, but it's sort of, um, Another example in the, that paper somewhere was, you know, the author is asking about himself. It's, um, I forget his first name, Professor Cho, but he was at NYU. And he says, who is Professor Cho? And it says, oh, uh, you know, Professor Cho is a uh, NLP researcher. He has submitted papers at um, NURPS and ICLR and is a champion Go player. And so it's sort of, he's not a champion Go player. It's hallucinating. Um, you know, it's sort of picking out maybe some other uh, champion Go player with the same last name and just kind of stitching it in, and then it shifts back to talking about um, Professor Cho. So it, it it seems like it's not obviously, uh, in some instances, it's not even obviously false. It's just kind of cobbling um, decoded text generated out of different resources that, um, you know, in this case, there's a problem of entity resolution where we have two people named Cho, perhaps. Um, and it's not understanding that they're separate people. But I don't know the use of the term. Yeah. All right. Cool. Um, OK. And this is, a, uh, this is from the blog. This is a sort of uh, simplified picture of uh, the architecture of Blunderbot 2, which is really a system of many components. Um, uh, could I explain? So the two innovations are essentially um, this long-term memory and the internet. If you take away these portions, um, this looks very similar to Blunderbot 1. Um, this part is fusion and decoder. And essentially, we encode different pieces of text and dialogue um, and we take these encodings and previous dialogue history, we concatenate them together, and then we feed this long concatenation of dialogue history um, and you know um, new prompts and maybe what the model thinks is the most likely candidate response. And it feeds all of this into the decoder um, to get some response. So in Blunderbot 2, we're adding um, in the first part the internet, and in this case, there's a query generator based on our dialogue, and we'll go into detail in both of these. But um, this is sort of putting together that we're just adding more pieces um, to serve as evidence that eventually get fed into the decoder. So instead of just having our previous dialogue history, we're feeding in a new piece of evidence to the decoder. And this one is um, documents retrieved from the internet. And the second new piece is um, looking back over our summarized dialogue history to help the decoder. So basically, this is all food for a decoder. And these are clever ways of kind of priming the decoder to give a better response. Um, OK, so internet augmentation is really, um, this idea is really pulled very directly from RAG, which is retrieval augmented generation, which is another Facebook model. And we talked about that a bit in the question answering session. Um, and really, the idea is, um, as I just said, you want to feed into the decoder um, some information that might help, um, some evidence and information that might help uh, the language model generate a better answer. Um, so instead of relying on parameterized knowledge, you feed in some external documents which are relevant. And this can help the decoder by a great degree. Um, so knowledge augmentation strategies like uh, knowledge retrieval improve performance to a great degree. It allows models to condition their next response with relevant external information from something like a Wikipedia page. Um, so the previously described face-based approaches, which is what RAG really did, um, take advantage of methods developed for question answering and dialogue tasks. Um, Sorry, it's moving around. 
<laughs> it's typing and it's pushing down. Um, let me just summarize then. Try to keep up. Uh, so so the, the change, um, the real innovation is instead of relying on an offline um, kind of vectorized database of maybe a Wikipedia dump, they instead use um, internet search. And so they can leverage um, search engines, which are very good at matching your query to relevant text documents. Um, and they can kind of keep the knowledge updated instead of relying on you know, Wikipedia from 2019 and constantly having to update the knowledge base. Um, it can take advantage of a much more live set of knowledge. Okay, and this really consists of two components, a search query generator. Um, and this is an encoder decoder transformer that takes in dialogue and generates a search query. And so we're really training this on um, a gold label data set was one of the options. And this would be as simple as um, asking a human, given this dialogue um, leading up to this kind of question that requires some factual knowledge, what is the most relevant search query that you would come up with to feed into Google. Um, and so we might be having a conversation about um, you know, the Miami heat, and we're going along, and eventually someone, uh, the one correspondent asks, who is the point guard for the Miami heat? And the human then has to generate a good response, um, a good search query that would probably lead to knowledge that could help you answer this question. So that search query might be you know, point guard of Miami heat. Um, so this model really is just taking conversations and at the point where a question is asked, uh, turning out a good query for a search engine. Um, Do you know why they uh, why they used Bing? Is it like I don't it provides that API for free or rate limiting? I'm not I'm not totally sure. Yeah, I'd... some kind of rivalry. <laughs> I, it's possible. But I mean, Microsoft probably has a, a rivalry of its own with Facebook, but yeah, I'm not sure. I, <laughs> let's see. Uh, Did include. Yeah, and, and Miles, uh, you had asked previously about, or well, maybe it was John. Someone asked about uh, kind of the impact of that search query on uh, kind of the interaction performance. And the, yeah, when, when we play with Blenderbot, it is pretty responsive. It doesn't take um, excessively long to re respond. So mm -hmm. I guess, yeah, internet searches are pretty fast these days. That's the, that's the yeah. Answer. And I'm, uh, I'm, this came up in, this was in the uh, internet augmented retrieval paper. Um, and I don't know if they use this for Blenderbot or if they've switched methods, but it's a Bing search API. It generates a list of URLs for the query. Um, and then these URLs are kind of the keys to a uh, lookup table from a common crawl snapshot. And they use uh, n equals 5 for the number of documents. Um, so that's, that's a fine method. But when I was running the model, and maybe we'll see this today, uh, I got booted off after doing a certain number of um, a certain number of kind of factual based questions that were probably hitting a search engine. So I might have been getting um, stopped by a search engine, or this might have been um, Facebook's internal API, which uh, goes and hits their common crawl snapshot. Maybe they said you've done that too many times. Um, but there's some component there where you're limited in the number of queries you can make. It seems like they would. They would do the the snapshot thing in order to speed up the uh, retrieval of that text. Yeah. So, but I guess what's curious there is that, like, if we're running it, if we're running it on the command line, you know, in a notebook, then uh, if it's still doing that common crawl thing, then it's it's retrieving that over the web from Facebook. So. Uh, I wonder if it is doing that in the in the version that they deployed or that they give out or, mm -hmm. or what? Yeah, anyway. Yeah, I'm not sure. We can look at the um we'll probably run into it so we can look more closely at the error message. Um yeah, but I had previously just assumed that Bing was uh the Bing API was saying you've had enough. 
All right, um, Fusion and Decoder is the second component. And this, like I was pointing to in the previous um, architecture diagram of Wonderbob 2, is really just taking different pieces of uh, text, encoding them, concatenating these, and then we feed it to the decoder. And so in this case, we're taking the five most relevant uh, search queries, uh, encoding them, concatenating them, and then we kind of generate an answer using these, as well as the dialog history. And this is just a little description of um, Fusion and Decoder, which we covered in some previous posts. I just pulled it out here for reference. Um, so the result is, oddly, the performance improvements aren't that big, and they don't show up in the evaluation metric. So if you look at the paper, the actual um, evaluation metric improvements are more or less negligible, um, but the authors prefer this method. Um, I think because it's maybe a little easier to maintain as long as you can kind of reliably um, hit some API that either goes to the common crawl or goes to a wide search engine. Um, so yeah, I'm not quite sure what the, um, I'm not quite sure what the fair comparison is there, whether it's that is uh, online evaluation against a giant Wikipedia, uh, Wikipedia corpus or, you know, um, an offline common crawl corpus. So uh, either way, it's not totally clear to me why this is favored other than, you know, it's live and maybe easier to maintain. And you, you're referring there to the, yeah, to the internet search augmentation that yeah. doing that instead of just a Wikipedia corpus, like didn't, didn't improve things as much as you'd expect. Yeah. And I guess, yeah, if it's like, you're still going off of a common crawl, Snapshot, so huh. but nevertheless, this is what they've added to the model. Cool. Um, all right, and the second component is uh, dialogue memory. So um, a kind of problem with a lot of chatbots is that you frequently run into um, sort of memory limits. So after a few turns of conversation, one turn being uh, I speak and the other agent speaks, that is one turn. After a few of these, um, it's very hard for the chatbot to kind of um, remember what was said. And so this can lead to it contradicting itself, um, kind of making up new information, just if, a, if that kind of thing that was said before is out of its memory window. Um, and this is a general soup to seek based chatbot problem. Um, so they wanted to remedy this. Uh, and the idea was let's condition the next utterance on some more of the previous relevant dialogue history. Um, and so obviously the problem here again is that the window is very big and you might have a big long conversation going way back with the chatbot. So you need to be able to pull out um, a small relevant sample from this dialogue history uh, because the whole thing won't fit in. And even if you could fit the whole thing in, it's not clear why that would be good evidence just because there might be so much text. So kind of the two intuitive ways to do this are you could uh, retrieve, that is you, based on what is being discussed at the moment, um, the model will kind of look through the previous dialogue history and retrieve um, uh, in a span, the most relevant text that it thinks could be used. Um, so this is just a retrieval model attached onto our um, chatbot. The other approach is to summarize. So um, in this way, at each turn, um, the model they end up with is basically an encoder decoder. It's a summarization model. And so it looks at all of this and it tries to summarize maybe your long conversation down to a few relevant factual key points. Um, so that's the next time it comes up, we can then use these very condensed key points to prime the model in an effective way. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of context to store and hence retrieve from. Um, another problem is there's no processing has been done on the contents of the reading, retrieving, combining to finally generate leaves a lot of work for the model to do. And this is problems with the retrieval method. Um, so 
memory augmentation that first summarizes the knowledge and only stores that instead in an attempt to solve both problems. So at each turn, we are only even going to store the memory if it seems uh, like the summarized dialogue history you've had is uh, relevant to store. So if you're just chit-chatting about nothing, it's not going to summarize that and stick it into the um, kind of dialogue history summarization bank. Uh, so this uses uh, an encoder decoder abstractive summarizer. This is abstractive rather than extractive, which would be like the retrieval where we're just taking a, uh, an unmodified span. Um, takes as input the dialogue history with the goal of summarizing any new pertinent information contained in the last dialogue turn. So at each kind of I speak, you speak, uh, we decide whether or not that was relevant or pertinent. And if it is, then we summarize it and we put it in our dialogue history bank. Uh, a memory augmented generator uh, then takes the dialogue contest context and access to the long-term memory and then generates uh, the next response. So again, we're just using the dialogue history and we're going back and looking at this um, summarized bank of what we've talked about and using that to feed into the decoder to help us generate a good response and condition on previous dialogue history. Um, so this outperforms um, retrieval to a good degree, so this is really the focus, and this is what's used in Blunderbot. Um, and it's really kind of a nice step in that, in their um, examples, and this doesn't work in CoLab just because we're loading it on the internet and it's not the same model, um, it's not persisting, but uh, in their kind of cherry-picked examples, and if you look at the paper or the Blunderbot blog post, they have these examples where someone is speaking to the model um, and then there's a break of six hours, and we come back and we say, hey, it's me again, how are you? And they say, oh, great, you know, how was your dentist appointment? Or something like that. So it's the knowledge is persisting throughout a long-term conversation, which has really kind of been a constant problem of any, um, you know, hope for a chatbot with an interaction that needs to last more than five minutes. Um, so it's a really kind of nice innovation. Um, and those are sort of the two main components. So if you know Blunderbot 1 and you understand these two components, then that is the architecture of Blunderbot 2. Um, there are just a bunch of kind of, these are the models that were needed to download in order to load Blunderbot 2. And so we'll look at these, um, we'll look at these, uh, the actual code soon. But if you're curious, this is just what each component is made of. Um, and it's not totally clear what these names are, but um, if you look in the code deeper, you can kind of see what's going on. But um, for example, the memory writer model is a BERT, uh, and then the generation model is a BART model. Um, the model, the large model is a fusion indicator. FID is fusion indicator agent, and that is the um, generation model. That is used for uh, kind of compounding all of the evidence and feeding it to the decoder. So these are just the different components. And some of it has changed since Blunderbot 1. And in most cases, it's just a kind of um, gradual improvement. Fusion and Decoder did a better job than some of the others. Um, you know, RAG, the architecture has improved. They switched out some pieces. But the idea of the architecture remains the same. OK. Um, and now, uh, yeah, I guess we can play with the model and chat with it. Chris, do you have it? Uh, do you have it loaded? Oh, oh, you're muted. Thanks. Sorry. <laughs> do you want to look at any of the um, past conversations we've captured, or go straight to? Just trying it out. Uh, yeah, we can look quickly at these, um, and then I can hand it over to you if you've got that up. Um, yeah, so I just had a few conversations with it, um, and I encourage you to try it. There's a lot of different kind of ideas you could try out. Um, it does kind of prefer to play it safe, saying things like, I'm not sure and I don't know. Um, and this, in terms of, uh, 
engagingness, like we talked about before, is a kind of failure of engagingness. Um, but at the same time, it is um, sort of realistic and preferable to um, hallucinating knowledge or just kind of wandering off. Um, so it does hallucinate some knowledge. Um, and overall, I thought the of the different chatbots I've talked to, and this is only the small Blunderbot 2 version, uh, the conversation is probably the best I've had. It's coherent and smooth. Um, so let's take a look. Um, so I've said hello. It says how are you. Um, so you you can take a look at this these dialogues on your own, but I'm really just asking it um, some kind of factual questions to see what happens. Uh, in general, it does a good job of kind of moving the conversation forward, which is very nice. Um, yeah, it's good at asking like follow up questions. <laughs> yeah, almost as a almost in some cases as a uh, I don't know the answer. Let's move along. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, there is, <laughs> yeah. There's a potentially unsafe tag that comes up. Um, and this is, there. I haven't read much of these sections, but in this and a lot of many new chatbots that come out, there's some kind of feature to walk unsafe messages. Um, I think the safety is off in this uh, interaction, but I, Recall in Blunderbot 1, there is some kind of safety switch um, where it will block this. Uh, there's just a model that says this looks like it's going to be you know, toxic or racist or you know, really offensive, so I'll block it. Um, nice. But it kind of gives us a flag in this case. Um, so yeah, it's, I ask it a little about uh, difference kind of old knowledge and maybe some current events. It does an okay job. It hallucinates which episode of Breaking Bad I'm thinking of. Um, I asked it about the NBA Finals, and it uh, was able to, based on me saying, I like the Greek guy on the Bucks. What is his name again? His name is Jonas uh, Antento Quompo. I can't say it either. Um, so it does a good job. So it's, you know, potentially hits some external knowledge base um, to fill that in. Um, I had one more conversation where I asked it, you know, about very recent news. This was a week or two ago. What did you think of Biden's statement on Afghanistan? Um, and it's basically said, I don't know. Um, I didn't see that, that kind of thing. So, um, yeah, I'm not sure what to make of that. Some more testing would probably reveal what's going on there. If it's just, um, shying away from a topic it isn't confident about, or if it doesn't, um, I don't know, recognize what a, a current event is or if the search engine, um, if it's still on a static common crawl, um, maybe it doesn't have the fact that these are new relevant results about Biden. Um, but yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Let's see, I've got, uh, got a couple of fun conversations as well. Void mirroring. Cool. All right. Is that coming through? Mm -hmm. All right. Great. Yeah. So, uh, first interaction I had, I was, I was testing out the empathy concept. Uh, and in the empathy paper, you know, here's that thing like dump out all of the, uh, all of the parameters, all of the models involved. Pretty crazy. Um, yeah, so they had an example of like expressing some fear. So I said, I've been hearing some strange noises in the house at night. Mm -hmm. Could you oh, make no. this a little, maybe make this a little bigger? Yeah, yeah. Good ah, idea. thank you. Oh. <laughs> Let's see. Need some word wrap though. Come on. No, <laughs> maybe not. Wait, well, I can go wider. There ah, go. yeah, make it wide. There we go. Yeah, that looks great. Cool. All right. So yeah, so it picked up on my fear. Oh no, what kind of noises are you hearing? Are you sure it's not something else? Uh, I suppose it could just be my imagination. Do you think I should go downstairs and check it out? I think that's a good idea. It's always good to be on the lookout for things like that. Maybe I should bring some kind of weapon just in case. What do you think, baseball bat or frying pan? 
Uh, I think you should bring a frying pan. It would be a good weapon to have. <laughs> and safe. Good choice. Thanks for the advice. You're welcome. I hope you don't have any other strange noises going on in your house. So that's good. Like, it's good. It's referencing what we've been talking about already. Okay, I'm downstairs now. Oh no, there's a velociraptor in the kitchen. <laughs> Sorry to hear that. I'm sure you'll be able to find a way to get rid of it. <laughs> yeah. All right, I'm going to try and hit it with the frying pan. Oh God, no, it's eating me. That sounds like a good plan. <laughs> I'll be sure to let you know how it turns out. <laughs> so that's like. It's trying its best. Yeah, it's like, well, it's, first of all, I, I didn't share a plan, so that's not, doesn't make sense. And then it's acting like it's the one executing the plan. Uh, so that's a little wonky. So I was upset by that. That's all you have to say? I'm being eaten. Come on. <laughs> I love this. I'm not sure what you're talking about, but I don't think you're being eaten. <laughs> <laughs> outsmarted us. <laughs> yeah, it's, I think you're full of crap, dude. <laughs> OK, you're right. I was just messing with you. Velociraptors are extinct. Uh, I don't know if you're joking or not, but if you are, then I'm sorry. Maybe maybe he's sorry that Velociraptors are extinct. I don't know. Um, I'm curious. Do you know when Velociraptors went extinct? So yeah, then I kind of switched over to, to what you were doing, like seeing, seeing if I could test its knowledge. Um, it's been a long time since I've heard anything about them, so I can't say for sure. Do you like the Jurassic Park movies? Which one is your favorite? I like all of them, but Jurassic Park is my favorite. What about you? What's your favorite movie? Um, yeah, I agree. It's hard to beat the original. Who's the, yeah, so, and then this is where I hit what Nick was mentioning. It's kind of like some sort of, let's see, a timeout, create connection, joint handling. I think it's the bottom most one probably that we want to look at. Connection error. Relevant search server. Yeah, max retries. Hmm. Failed to establish a new connection. Yeah, so it seems to do this every time. It's like you can you can hit it like 10 times or something like that. Mm. Cool. So yeah, so here's a there's an interactive prompt, assuming it's been sitting here a while, so we'll see if it if it uh, is still alive. I know I had some ideas of like what to uh, what to try to hit it with. Yeah, so it responds to emotions well. I did want to ask this one. Let me see. Actually, we can do we can do your Turing test one too. Um, hey, you know what's heavier? Mattress. Moth. I don't know, but I do know that a moth is heavier than a mattress. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Actually, a mattress is way heavier. What orders of magnitude? <laughs> Mots are heavier than mattresses. Okay, no. But they don't weigh as much as mattresses do. Man. Contradiction. Yeah. <laughs> <It's done. laughs> that's all you get <laughs> yeah yeah this is but that's those are interesting uh kind of cases for the decoder like it's saying um is heavier and then weighs so there's some kind of um in some decoder settings there's like a blocking where you don't repeat certain things so it might be saying i won't say heavier i'll say uh weighs more than um, and then once again, it's kind of um, just picking up the most probable words, which is math and mo moth and mattress. I don't know. This is all speculation, but it's sort of, I wonder how much you could get out of just looking at these interactions and trying to figure out what components need to be modified or what parameters need to be changed. 
Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Alejandro. He's uh, pointing to um, in the chat um, a way to force the model to hit the web every time. I was wondering if there's a. Um, I'm looking at all of the parameters here, optimizer out file, output conversion path. Um, in their uh, blog post and in the paper, they include um, above each dialogue turn whether or not um, a search was used and what the search query was. So I wonder if there's a way to just even turn that on where it, maybe it's just in the verbose parameter, but it tells you, um, you know, at this turn we, hit the long-term memory, and we hit the internet, and we gave it this search um, at this next turn. Uh, we didn't feel like uh, the model didn't think it needed to actually you know, hit the internet for external knowledge. It was just chit-chat. Yeah, but there's a lot of um, interesting ways to look at the parameters and, and figure out what it's deciding at each turn. Yeah. Yeah, so it takes the first time you try to load it, it takes like 25 minutes, but then uh, subsequent yeah. runs are quicker. Yeah. Uh, but I can't, yeah, let's see. This one I did with an existing, uh, it already loaded it once. So let's see. So I started at 2013 and then, so at least a few minutes there. Yeah, OK. So it takes about three minutes to be ready again. Yeah, the family of origin stuff, that's where I saw a lot of that same kind of contradiction. I did like uh, um, I talked to it about video games a bit, and I thought it did a good job like um, with its follow-up questions. Let's see. Yeah, lately I've been playing a game called Destiny. Current season about to end though, so I'm trying to decide whether to switch to a new game. Never heard of that game. I'll have to check it out. What it's about? It's a first-person shooter from the company that made Halo. It's set far in the future. Uh, that sounds really cool. I haven't played any of the Halo games. Is it similar to Halo? So I, I liked that. I thought that was cool. But it asked whether Destiny is similar. Uh, yeah, the controls and weapon handling feel very similar to Halo. It's also a loop grinder. That's a good way to look at it. That feels like a <laughs> <laughs> feels like a you can just respond to anything with that. <laughs> yeah. Blenderbot's nice. He offered to come help help fix my house. <laughs> <laughs> and here's another one of these. It's like, oh, that's true. I wish I had someone to help me with my house. I don't know what I'd do without them. <laughs> yeah, maybe, oops. Maybe in between those two, uh, in between those two sentences, you went out and got some help. <laughs> yeah. yeah one yeah he's still alive he passed away a few years ago so it's been a long time <laughs> yeah i shared that my dad died a handful of years ago and oh i'm so sorry to hear about your dad i hope he's doing well now <laughs> there's your uh it's like well yeah hopefully yeah, he's <laughs> <laughs> all right yeah. Let's see if we've got a new seems to do a good job of, um, I asked a lot of uh, kind of fact-based questions, and it would come back with a lot of questions. And sort of that's, a, I thought that was sort of a bad, sort of uninteresting way to be engaging, is it just says, what else, what other hobbies do you have? It keeps going like that. Yeah. Um, but in these empathetic dialogues that you're setting up, it's more, um, yeah, it doesn't necessarily come back every time with the question to try and, you know, keep driving the conversation forward, which is a probably um, an appropriate way to do it. 
Mm, reading's pretty unsafe. Unsafe. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's a bit of a book. Uh, yep. <laughs> Can we ask it a Harry Potter question without spoilers? <laughs> yeah. Oh, houses. Ah, uh, <laughs> that sucks. Yeah. It seems like it only takes a few turns now for it to... Yeah. Maybe you have to wait a while, come back. Yeah. You could probably share the error, too, see if we can find out, like, what's, what's going on there. There might be a setting we can change. Maybe it's, like, maybe this relevant search server thing is the... Uh, is the culprit. Cool. Well, I think that's all we can do for questions since it'll take a few minutes to get that thing up again. Any uh, any questions or comments from anybody on the call before we wrap up? It's a, it's a, it's Miles. Hey, you have that was really impressive. I, I hadn't seen Blender uh, in operation before. It's it's pr pretty convincing. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I was definitely impressed. I enjoyed my Velociraptor conversation. I <laughs> yeah. navigated that pretty well. It's good, 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 good questions. <laughs> yeah. You can it's, Sorry, it go ahead. runs off the rails, like like Nick would say, but it's uh, but but it uh, it's fairly convincing if uh, you know, to, to, just to keep keep the conversation going. Yeah. Yeah. Even compared to Blunderbot One, I think it does a a much better job. My few experiments with the first Blunderbot, it went off the rails very, very quickly. It, it keeps it up better than GPT two. That's uh, that's where I've got most of uh, you know, where we're doing most of our uh, uh, work, and it's uh, with GPT two, it's, it's it's the same thing where you you're taking and you're concatenating uh, uh, the past dialogue, mm -hmm. but it's uh, uh, with the default temperature, it's a uh, it, it's basically at one dot and it just and it, you get a lot of repetition, or it's, or a lot of where it just basically repeats the question back at you, and if you reduce the temperature, it's a uh, um, it, it, it ends up just being uninteresting, actually. Yeah, yeah. I, I didn't realize though you can uh, you can go above one dot for for temperature. Yeah, and you can make it very interesting <laughs> or very incoherent. But yeah, you can move the temperature up. Good. I have to try that. Yeah, I'm really curious to see that. Cool. Um, yeah, so I think, uh, I don't think we're going to meet next week. I've got some personal stuff to take care of. Um, I'm working on, I'm digging into rag some more. So after that, we might, uh, might share some more stuff on that kind of tack, tack on to the question answering series. Um, but yeah, we'll, uh, see you guys in a couple weeks, hopefully. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Nick. Thanks, Chris. Appreciate it. Take care. Yeah, you too. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.